and such quality musicians. God has truly blessed us. Thank you for your service to us all. And thank you, Ben and Katie, for the great job that you do as well. You know, one of the things that we get to do as a church whenever we gather is to lift up our prayers together. There is, there is power in individual prayer, in the prayer closet, in getting alone with God, but there is a different kind of power when we can come together in agreement as his body gathered. So if you're at home or you're here in the room, let's join our hearts together and pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come before you to kneel before you, to worship and bow down, to kneel before our God and Maker, to recognize that you are God, to humble ourselves before your mighty hand and to know in due season you will lift us up, to cast our cares at the foot of your cross, Oh, gracious God, we are so grateful that you love us enough, that you have made a way that we can enter into the Holy of Holies, that we have a great high priest who has been tempted in every way just as we are, and yet you are without sin, and therefore we can approach the throne of grace with boldness in our hour of need. So, Father, that is how we come to you. We come to you unified as your church coming before you as your people with the cares and concerns on our heart. So, Father, today we pray that you would bless Georgianne Van Swall as her husband has gone on to be with you this week. Father, thank you for the surety that we have, that these things are written. You tell us through your word, these things are written so that we may know that we have eternal life. And so, Father, we thank you that we can approach even death knowing that it is not final, knowing that our sins have been covered, that our forgiveness has been purchased, and that when we leave this earth, we go to you. And so, Father, thank you for that assurance. And, Father, I pray for those who have lost loved ones, maybe this week or maybe in years past, that you would remind us again of the hope of the gospel, that whoever believes in you will not perish but will have everlasting life. And so, Father, we stand on the promise to know that we will see our loved ones again and we will see them as they were meant to be. For we see through a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Thank you for that promise, Lord. Thank you for that assurance. Thank you for that hope. And we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, and we thank you for it. Father, we pray for others in our congregation, some who have had, have had wonderful news of tests, whether they be from COVID being negative or whether being from biopsies and other things coming back clear. And so we thank you for those things. Father, others have gotten different kind of news this week, and so we just pray that you would give them strength. We pray for everyone in our congregation and those in our hearts who are suffering from this virus. And we ask, Father, that you would complete what you would do with it so that it may be gone, but that we would learn from you what it is that you want. For we trust and we know that all things work together for your glory and for our good, and we don't understand this one but help us to see that you are at work in this. Father, we look forward to the day when we can hug again. We look forward to the day when we can all be together again. But until then, may we trust in the Lord with all of our heart. May we not lean on our own understanding. May we acknowledge you even in this, in all of our ways, and would you make our paths straight. So we thank you for that, Father. We thank you, Father, that that you are the God of comfort and that you give us comfort in our time of need so that we may be comfort to others with the comfort that we ourselves have received. And so we pray for the Roberts family right now, Father, in the loss of their son. And we pray for others who have lost loved ones and ask, Lord, that we as your church would be your hands and feet, your feet of comfort to bring that comfort, to bring that hope, to bring that peace, even to bring the joy of the Holy Spirit. Use us as your church. And finally, Father, we do pray for our nation. We recognize that 
You are God. You are our hope. You are our strength. And you have given us a place to live. But Father, we also love this nation very much. And we ask, Father, that you would bring healing. That you would bring peace. That you would bring truth. And that those who you have placed over us would seek you in your wisdom that they may bless us. And so, Father, we trust all of these things to you and we ask that you would hear us. In fact, we know that you will hear us because we come in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, in 2017, Miriam Webster, the, the dictionary company, chose a word as the word of the year. Do you know what it was? Youth invasion. They made it one word. They made up a word, youth invasion, because they were talking about the way that, that the culture and everything else was being turned upside down. In 2018, they chose another word. Do you know what that word was? Toxic. Because everything seemed to be toxic. There was toxic this and toxic that. Then in 2019, they chose a word, and guess what that word was? Them. Whoever them is was the key word. We defined ourselves as us and them, and them was the key word. So what do you think the key word, the word of the year for 2020 is? What do you think? Lockdown. Indeed, indeed. Now, I want to propose to you that our word for 2021 Our word, and maybe even a national or international or word of the year, could be a made-up word called one anothering. Okay? Why don't we why don't we start start pushing that and saying this is the year of one anothering? How about that? Only thing that will get behind the mask is one anothering. The only thing that will draw us together without the hug is the one anothering. The thing that will make us stand out as a church and a community is one anothering. In fact, if you look through the New Testament, there's 59 different places where the term one anothering, one another, (laughs) is used. Now, somebody called me on that and said, I can only find 37 different one another's. I said, you're right, because things like love one another, that's repeated nine different times. Forgive one another, that's repeated seven different times. And so conceptually, yeah, there's 32, but literally there's 59 different places where we are commanded, where we are encouraged, where we are empowered to one another, one another. So I say that let's make 2021 the year of one anothering. What do you say? Anybody can I, can I get a... Yeah, let, let's do that. Yeah. Now, last week we looked at Hebrews chapter 10, and we saw that there was a uniqueness in the Christian community where we spur one another on to love and good deeds, where we, where we join together, where we are together in that. And that is something that is so attractive to a lost and dying world. In fact, I love the way that Diedrich Bonhoeffer put it this way. We'll come back to this. This is our passage for this morning. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're just going to be looking at a couple of verses there. But let's go ahead and and just read this together. You can remain seated. We've been standing a while this morning. Let's just read this together, though. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, there's a word, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's some strong teaching there, and we're going to unpack that a little bit. And Zoe, is there a way that you can change my view in the back to to text only? Thank you. Um, we're going we're gonna to unpack this a little bit, but I, I just want to talk a little bit about the uniqueness of the Christian community. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a prisoner of war. He was a political prisoner of the Nazis in wartime Germany. In fact, he was the leader of what they called the Confessing Church, which was those Lutherans in Germany who said, that ain't right. What's going on? That's just not right. He was eventually jailed for more than two years, 
And just two weeks before liberation, before the Americans came and liberated his prison camp, just two weeks before that, he was hung by the Nazis. If you're a historian or, in, or are fascinated by that period of history, I would highly encourage you to read anything you can by Diedrich Bonhoeffer because he lived out his faith in a very toxic environment. And this is what, this is what he said. Our community with one another in Christ consists solely in what Christ has done for us. Christian brotherhood is a spiritual and not just a human reality. In this, it differs from all other communities. When we think about what it means to be a community of faith, what it means to be a church, we need to understand that it's unique. It is very, very different. The way that we love one another, the way that we care for one another, the way that we comfort one another, the way that we spur one another on, it's unique. And quite honestly, those outside of the church, they're looking for that. And we're going to see why here in just a few minutes. So before we get there, let me ask you a question. Is it ever okay to be angry? Is it ever okay to be angry? Is it ever okay to let that anger just vent and destroy everything around you? So you know the answer to the first one is, of course. The second is, of course not. Is there some way? that that anger can be directed, vented, and controlled so that it doesn't destroy everything around it. And the answer to that, the the spoiler alert, the, the message is, yes, there is. And we're going to see just how the Lord has it for this. In fact, in the King James Version, verse 26 that we just read, has it probably the best translation Because it takes into account all of the Greek and everything that was going on and everything else. And it says this, be angry, sin not. Be angry, sin not. There is a type of anger that is godly. There is a type of anger. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, it says that God's anger is continually going after the godless. There is a type of anger that is powerfully destructive. And we are given right to do that. But there is also another kind of anger that is mutually destructive. There is a type of anger that can get inside of us and can destroy everything, all of the relationships, even our relationship with even ourself can be destroyed if that anger is not used rightly. In fact, in Hebrews it says this, See to it that no root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble. And by it, many become defiled. Have you ever known anybody that was just angry? They're just angry. It's like, what's the matter? Everything. Wow. They're just angry at the world. They're angry at everything around them. And they're just plain angry people. And they are destroying everything around them. That's what the writer of Hebrews was getting at there. Now, it's interesting, when, when, when you look at that passage in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, it says, be angry. Now, how many of us grew up saying, it, 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 it's really not nice to be angry? In, in fact, my grandmother used to say, it's not nice to not be nice. <laughs> Did anybody ever hear that growing up? It's like, you can't be angry. Leave, just get rid of that. Get rid of that. You don't want to be angry about anything. You need to just stuff that anger. And the problem is, you'd never stuff that anger. Because as it says here, let no root of bitterness spring up. It just comes out in some place. It's like, what is going on here? I I had a friend, a a dear friend, and she said, I don't understand it. At work, I can just be calm as a cucumber. I get home, and I blow up at everything. I had another friend who said, my wife, whenever we get in in a fight, she gets all historical. I said, you mean hysterical? She said, he said, no, no, historical. She brings up everything I ever did. And so we look at that and we go, where is that coming from? Well, you got to understand, Ephesians was written to a group of people that lived in a town called Ephesus. And Ephesus was a very cosmopolitan kind of place. It was a crossroads. People were coming from all over. And when they came, they brought their ideas with them. And so it was basically an urban center. 
If you can imagine the, the difference in, in living in a small town versus living in New York City, you're going to get a lot more influences. Well, two of those influences were the Stoics and the Epicureans. So they were Greek philosophies and really Greek worldviews that talked about everything from politics to emotions. And so the Stoics believed, the Stoics believed that everything physical was bad. And so everything that had to do with your emotions, you had to just beat them. And so you were taught to stuff them, to get angry, to get emotional, to get sad, to get anything else, was to show weakness. And so in a stoic mindset, a stoic philosophy, if you showed any emotion, especially anger, it was a sign of weakness. And so you were told to just keep a stiff upper lip. We still have that word around. People who are completely unfazed by anything at all, we call them what? They're being very stoic. Well, on the other side of that, there were the Epicureans. And the Epicureans were literally just the opposite. They believed, if you got an emotion, go with it. If you're in a situation that doesn't make you happy, just leave. Anger, you should never put yourself in a place where you're angry because just get away from it. If you don't like the job, just quit and get away from it. If you don't like the, the relationship, just quit and get away from it. Whatever is causing you pain, anger, or any other emotion, if you don't want that, even if you don't like what you're eating, just leave the plate and go find something else. They were Epicureans, and they said, go with your emotions. Let them lead you wherever they will, because that's where you're going to be happy. And Paul speaks into that and says, it's not stoic. Your anger is not stoic. Nowhere is, is your anger Epicurean. Rather, your anger needs to be godly. Your anger needs to be associated towards something that will keep you closer. This is the way that Tim Keller describes that kind of anger. He says, anger is the capacity to be aroused to action by the sight of evil. It is put into us by God, and it is part of being made in his image. Anger is the ability, listen to this, to defend something and to attack something that is threatening that which is precious. Therefore, anger in its proper place is a precious thing. Anger in its proper place is a precious thing. Where do we see anger? We see anger in 2 Corinthians 7 where Paul says, righteous, anger that leads to righteousness is good. I mentioned it in the book of Romans where God's anger is burning towards the, towards the um, unregenerate. His wrath. But in Mark chapter 3, there's a place in Mark chapter 3 that, that honestly, until I went back this week and read it more closely, I had never noticed it. How many of us kind of have this picture of a Jesus who sort of floats through the New Testament, just sort of like, hello, I'm Jesus, you know? How many of us have that sort of that, that either stoic view of Jesus where he was never, never emotional about anything or an Epicurean kind of view where he was actively engaged in everything, but we don't have that balanced view that God's talking about. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus is in the synagogue, and a man comes with a withered hand, and it was on the Sabbath, and this man comes up with a withered hand. We don't know if it was right or left. It doesn't matter. And Jesus sees the Pharisees coming up like this. And in the Bible, Jesus says, it says, and Jesus was angry. And he looked at the Pharisees and he says, tell me, if it, is it his right to heal on the Sabbath? Is it right to do God's will on the Sabbath day? And they didn't say anything. And Jesus looked at him, and right in their face, he heals the man. Why was Jesus angry? He was angry because these folks were taking something that was meant to be a gift, the gift of the Sabbath, a day to set aside and worship and, and follow after God, and they were taking it and turning it into a rule, turning it into a I'm in and you're out, turning it into a barrier. And Jesus was angry because they were perverting the very word of God. And he vented his anger towards them. What gets you angry? What gets you angry? Does injustice get you angry? We should have all been angry at what happened to George Floyd. 
We should all be angry at the reaction of what happened to George Floyd. We should all be angry at injustice, but it's got to be a righteous anger. It cannot be a whipped up anger. We should all be angry at the things that displease God, especially in our own lives, and we should say, I don't want that. In the lives of those that we love because it is precious to us, we should vent our anger towards those things, but never towards a person. Be angry, but do not sin. Tim Keller again says it this way. When speaking of forgiveness, forgiveness. You see, anger, anger is one of those things that gets inside of us and perverts the way we see the world. You see, guilt comes in and it says, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. I am so I owe you an apology. It builds a, a system in us where we owe somebody something. I owe you an apology. Let me try to make it better. I owe you. But anger comes in and it says this. You owe me. You owe me something. In fact, it was kind of interesting. I'm so glad we said the, the Lord's Prayer today because um, in my previous job, I was a denominational executive and traveled the country literally going to different churches. And I would usually preach or speak or lead the worship time. And a lot of times we'd say the Lord's Prayer. And when you first come to a congregation and you get to that part, forgive us our, sometimes they say sins, sometimes they say debts, and sometimes they say trespasses, right? And so you're leading out here and you go, and forgive us our, and you just have to wait to hear what the word's going to be. You know? The word is debts. Forgive us our debts as you have forgiven our debts against you. You see, anger builds up an you owe me kind of attitude. It creates a debt-debtor relationship. And as such, we demand payment. Tim Keller says it this way, when speaking of forgiveness, Jesus used the image of debts to describe the nature of sins. When someone seriously wrongs you, there's an absolutely unavoidable sense that the wrongdoer owes you. Billy Joel was a, a singer in the 80s. Um, his breakout hit was, I love you just the way you are. How many of you had that sung at your wedding or have heard it at a wedding? I mean, I love you just the way you are. It's just beautiful. I mean, oh, everybody cries every time we hear it and all that kind of stuff. But interestingly, about two years later, he wrote an autobiographical song. And it was called Angry Young Man. And when you look back over Billy Joel's life, you can see where that anger showed up and destroyed all kinds of relationships. Now, this is not about Billy Joel. This is about us. Because so many of us, so many of us carry anger. Carry anger deep down and we're looking for someone to pay us back. You owe me. You owe me. You owe me. Every time we vent anger inappropriately, not righteously, but inappropriately, we are looking to get paid back. Somebody owes us something, and somebody's going to pay me back. He goes on and he says, anyone who has been wrong feels a compulsion to make the other pay that debt. We do that by hurting them, yelling at them, making them feel bad in some way, or just waiting and hoping that something bad happens to them. Only after we see them suffer in some equal way do we sense that the debt has been paid. And that sense of obligation is gone. This sense of debt, liability, and obligation is impossible to escape. Anyone who denies it exists has simply not been wronged or sinned against in any serious way. And then he goes on and he says, what then is forgiveness? Forgiveness means giving up the right to seek repayment from the one who has harmed you. But it must be recognized that forgiveness is a form of voluntary suffering. Forgiveness is always extremely costly. It is emotionally very expensive. It takes much blood, sweat, and tears. You see, destructive anger simply says, you owe me. You owe me and I'm not going to rest until I am paid back. 
That kind of destructive anger is what the book of Hebrews was talking about when it says, see to it that no bitterness rises up because it has caused the defilement of many. You see, anger and forgiveness are two sides of the same coin. Our anger is vented because somebody owes us something and we are going to extract that from somebody. In fact, Larry Crabb goes on and he says it this way. Destructive anger says that you owe me. Anger is not just an open door. Because in our passage it says, remember what it says there? It says, by keeping anger you open the door. You open the door for Satan to get a foothold. You open that door for Satan to come in and say, hey, how's it going? Hey, what about that over there? And soon the tentacles of that start moving out into every other relationship. It's not just an open door, it's also an open book. I'm a bookkeeper and according to my records, you owe me. And I'm not going to close this account until I get paid back. Until you make it up to me. Until you repay me what you took from me. And as long as that account is open, I'm going to carry that anger. Mm. Wow. Does anybody feel stepped on right now? Does anybody feel like, uh-oh, where are you going with this, Mike? Because you've, you've exposed me. You've shown me exactly where I'm coming from. Yes, I am that angry man. Yes, I am that angry woman. Yes, my anger vents towards those that I love the most. Yes, I'm that one who goes all historical. I'm that one who brings it up. I'm that one that won't let it go. What do we do with that? Well, the Scripture makes it incredibly clear. In verse 31, it says, get rid of it. Get rid of all. Get rid of all. If you've ever been to the doctor and he gives you that horrible diagnosis, cancer, what do you want to say? Let's get rid of it. Let's just, whatever it takes, let's cut it out, let's get rid of it, let's get rid of it all. And so the Bible says the very same thing. If there's anger within you, if there is unpaid debts within you, you need to get rid of all. But Mike, you don't know my story. You don't know what that person did to me. Do you want to get better? Get rid of all. But if you just listen to my story, you would hear how terrible it is. And I would say, yeah, let's sit down and talk. Let me hear your story. Now what are you going to do with it? Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. And then he goes on and he says, be kind and compassionate to one another. And there's our word. Forgiving one another. But Mike, you don't know what they did forgiving one another. You can't ask me to simply forgive. I am because you see there's a standard by which we are to forgive. And that's found in the rest of that verse. Forgiving one another just as in Christ you have been forgiven. You see, forgiveness breaks the power of destructive anger. And it's the only thing that can. And the only way that you can forgive that one that, that owes you, yes, they owe you. Absolutely, they owe you. And the only way that you can forgive that is to receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. The only way you're going to break that power of anger in your life, in your relationships, even within yourself, is to receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and say, now that I have been forgiven, I will choose to forgive. Now, earlier on in that passage, it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. What does that mean? Well, it might mean deal with it in 24 hours. When I was a young pastor and, and counseling couples, I would always say, now make sure that if y'all get in a fight, you deal with it before you go to bed. One of them came back and said, we tried to deal with it until 5 a.m. and then we were both exhausted and we got in another fight. What he's saying there 
is if possible, deal with it within 24 hours. That person who has made you angry, that person who owes you that you build up that kind of relationship with, if possible, deal with it like that. But if not, carry that account as short as possible. Because you know what happens? You know what happens? We will be angry. We will be hurt. We will be genuinely angry at someone early in life And then that season of life will close and we'll move into another season of life. And then we'll move into another season of life and we're still carrying that baggage. We're still carrying that anger. We're still carrying that you owe me attitude. But now all of a sudden we're carrying it over here to a completely different set of people. And all of a sudden that venting that should have gone over here ends up going over here. And somebody looks and says, you're just angry all the time. Well, I wasn't before. Actually, I think you were. I think you brought that anger along with you. And that's why the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let that season of life go by without addressing that anger. And so I want to give you three Steps, but I hate to call them steps because that minimizes all of this. I want, to, I want to give you three levels to deal with the anger, the unforgiveness, the things that are keeping you from, from forgiving one another just as in Christ you have been forgiven. First of all, identify with whom you're angry. Now it would be real easy to, to say, I'm angry at him. I'm angry at her. Of course I am. Not so fast. Not so fast. You may have anger from a childhood where mom and dad said it would be forever and it wasn't forever. And that man walked out on you and stole from you a happy childhood. Stole from you security. Stole from you a reputation. Stole from you something that you have never even put your hand on and yet you're still angry about it today. You may have been in a job Where someone stole an idea from you and took that promotion that you deserved, that you earned, and you have yet to deal with that anger. And so you're venting it on those who are close now. I don't know what your story is, but I want to encourage you sometime today, sometime as you think about this passage, this message, To go back and say, God, what is it that I'm really angry about? Identify who you are angry with. And then secondly, determine what they owe you. If you remember anger, lack of forgiveness is, you owe me. Identify what it was that they actually took from you. And the more detailed you can be about this, the more healing you will experience. I can tell you that. What is it that they took from you? Did they take your security? Did they take your fortune? Did they take years and years and years of your life? Should they have been at your wedding and they weren't? Should they have been at your graduation and they weren't? Should they have been at your ball games and they weren't? What did they take from you? And what's very, very interesting, if you you really get beneath this process, you'll find out there's no way they could ever pay you back. How, How do they make up for for feeling abandoned at 16 years old? How, what, what can they do to make that right? What, how can they possibly make up years and years and years invested that fell apart? The deeper you get into this step, this phase, this process, the more you'll realize they can't pay you back anyway. And so that leads to the th- The third level, literally call out their name and say, you don't owe me anymore. I forgive. You don't owe me anymore, and I refuse to make others try to pay a debt that you can't pay. And then cancel that debt. And what you will experience is a type of, a forgiveness that allows you to forgive others, not because you have been so great, but because you have realized 
that you have been forgiven. Because you see, every forgiveness, every forgiveness, every debt must be paid. That's why Jesus Christ on the cross said, Father, forgive them. In the Aramaic, it's testelestai, which means all debts paid, all debts forgiven. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive me. Because you see, when I realize that I have been forgiven everything, it's only then that I can forgive everything. C.S. Lewis said it this way, in the shadow of my hurt, forgiveness feels like a decision to reward my enemy. But in the shadow of the cross, forgiveness is merely a gift from one undeserving soul to another. This cross, any cross you see, Anytime you see a cross, if you wear a cross, anytime you see a cross, you say, I'm forgiven. By that cross, I am forgiven. And because I am forgiven, I can forgive. Because I have been forgiven, how could I not forgive? And so I want to offer this prayer. Heavenly Father, someone has taken something from me, and I have held on to that debt long enough. I choose to cancel it. They don't owe me anymore. Just as you forgave me, I forgive them. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the practicality of your word. Father, so many of us live in anger. So many of us know people who are wrapped up in so much anger. And yet forgiveness breaks the power of anger. Forgiveness breaks the power of bitterness. Forgiveness breaks the power of sin. And that's why you went to the cross to forgive us. And so, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would illuminate our hearts to reveal to us our anger, our unrighteous anger, and to quicken in us righteous anger to attack the things that are attacking your, your great name. Father, I pray that we would all have the strength to sit down with this prayer at some point today or tomorrow to sit down with a journal or just sit in quiet with you. And would you search us? Would you try us? And, you, and would you reveal to us those ways that we are unforgiving? And then, Father, by your power, I pray that we would reach out and forgive one another just as in Christ we have been forgiven. And, Father, all of these things are, are absolutely impossible to do apart from your spirit, apart from your presence, and apart from your blessing. And so we seek that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.